Okay, hello and welcome everyone to the uh, the astronomy and physics uh, mini symposia this year. Uh, so on behalf of myself and then my other co-chairs, uh, Brigitte and Michael, we just want to welcome you and thanks very much everyone for tuning in. Uh, and we just want to remind everyone that uh, the chat is obviously there, but also if you have questions for the speaker, please go ahead and ask in the Q&A session, which uh, or the Q&A uh, chat window, and we'll be monitoring that. And uh, we'll also try and make sure that if there's any questions we don't get to in the session, that we'll migrate them over to the Slack, which uh, was just made. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Uh, so without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and kick things off, and we're going to start with a talk uh, from Zufina on uh, conformal mapping with SymPy. So please take it away, and thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. So welcome, everybody. I will talk about uh, conformal mappings uh, in times of digitalization and numerics. So, uh, excuse me, can you see the screen? Yes. Uh, yeah, we can see fine. OK, perfect. So, uh, conformal mappings with SymPy towards Python driven analytical modeling in physics. This work is done at Highlight International, a company in Germany that <clears throat> produces valves and other hydraulic equipment for the automotive industry. This work is done with Erich Gertig, a colleague of mine. And the uh, agenda of the talk is the following. Excuse me, we have lost your share screen. If you could reshare it again. Okay, yes. Okay, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the agenda is the following. I will start with a motivation of the problem. Then we will I will present what uh, the flow past an annular domain is, in particular an ec eccentric annular domain. Then I will show how I, a conformal map um, maps the eccentric annular domain to the concentric annular domain, where it's easier to solve the problem. And then I will show how the eccentric annular domain can be mapped, mapped to a rectangular domain. Then I will proceed with a conclusion and so and show some references. So the, the motivation of this uh, topic of this research is that a hydraulic valve is actuated. So uh, we have to push uh, the spool, which is blue here, so that some path can be opened or closed so that the fluid with which we do fluid power transmission, power transmission to make mechanical changes in the car can be controlled. So in order to move the blue spool, uh, the armature has to move. It moves to the right and it moves because of Ampere's law. We, we energize the coil and then there's a magnetic field that moves the armature because some magnetic force, the Lorentz force acts on the armature. Now there, there is oil everywhere, in particular between the armature and the pole cap. You don't see the gap, but there's a gap. If there weren't a gap, the armature couldn't move. And the gap is our flow domain. So we see here in gray, the flow domain. The inner circle, the red one, is the armature and the outer circle, the blue one, is the pole cap. So we have a flow in the, gray in the gray domain. And if the armature is not perfectly centered, if it's not concentric, it is eccentric. And here it is, the eccentricity is B is in the middle. Here it shows how much the red circle has been displaced with respect to the origin. And now our, the question is, does eccentricity have an influence 
on the force that, that acts on the armature. Because when the armature moves, it will take the fluid with it, the oil, because it is viscous. And that viscous flow will drag the armature. And uh, sometimes in the literature, you see that <clears throat> this force does not depend on eccentricity. And here we will show that it does. And SymPy will help us with that. So the methods we will use are conformal mappings. Some of these were used already 100 years ago. For example, in viscous flow through pipes with cores, we will use conformal mappings, a conformal mapping tool from this book, from Brown and Churchill. And of course, we will use SymPy, symbolic pies. So wh what is the idea? What do we have to do? We can, we can cal calculate the force that acts upon the surface of the inner cylinder of the armature. That means that on the red circle, by solving this problem, which is a problem to solve for the velocity, the fluid velocity. Since the armature moves, that means that the inner circle, the red one moves, there's a prescribed velocity on the inner boundary. And on the outer boundary, there is no movement, so the fluid velocity is zero. And in the interior, we have here this. So the sum of the second derivatives of the velocity is zero. This is the Stokes equation, Stokes problem, which derives from the famous Navier-Stokes equation when the nonlinear parts can be dropped in the incompressible situation. Now, if the problem were concentric, and the <clears throat> then a solution is known. Here we see uh, the solution plotted. The red circle moves, so there we have a prescribed velocity. The outer boundary does not move, so we have zero there. One can easily check that this is the solution. If the radius r is on the outer radius, <clears throat> um, let me see this again. Exactly, then we have uh, the logarithm of one, the logarithm of one is zero, so we have zero velocity. If um, the radius is the inner uh, radius, then we have the same numerator and denominator and we have the prescribed velocity. So this is correct. Now, but we, we don't have the eccentric case, but there's a hint from the French mathematician Jacques Hadamard who said that the shortest path between two truths in the real domain passes through the complex domain. So we may use that hint and we will use it. So with a bilinear transformation, a Möbius transform, we can transform the eccentric annulus to the concentric annulus. We see that there is such uh, the inner um, boundary gets to be the outer boundary and the outer boundary gets to be the inner boundary. This is no problem. We only have to keep that in mind. Yes, I said this is a bilinear transform. It's also called Möbius transform, but this Möbius transform has nothing to do with the inverted Möbius strip that is used for time travel in the um, by the Avengers. Now. I will show a, a live demo. So what could be the procedure? One has the problem in a complicated domain in the plane, and then one looks in a book uh, uh, for a transformation that transforms the complicated domain to a simple domain. And in SymPy, we have a nice LaTeX rendering. So one can just type up the, the, tra the transform that one wants to use. Here I imported uh, SymPy as Sym, so I have the symbols that I need. We will do we will do symbolic cal calculations with the symbols. In this case here, I use uh, this bilinear transform, so one implements it. And one can see if what implemented is correct. 
So then one can see if it is correct. Yes, and that's the um, conformer map I wanted to use. We have this nice lattice rendering if we use SymPy in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, but since the solution that I looked up in the book from Brown and Churchill requires that the inner, that the outer circle has radius one, I have to scale. But this is simply done by using the subs function. And then it should just work. In order to get the new Cartesian coordinates, I have to separate a real and imaginary part from this term, which could be done with pen and paper. However, it's easier to use SumPy. So um, there's a function called real that I can just use. So I get the real part. And there's also a SymPy function, which is very practical, which is called simplify. OK. Typo. Exactly. So here, this is the new x-axis variable. And I can do the same thing with the imaginary part. So I get the new y variable. And expressed in this new Cartesian coordinates, my problem has a simple geometry. So th this is the geometry in psi and ether. And psi is the real part of the Möbius transform, and ether is the imaginary part of the Möbius transform. And here, the solution is easy. Um, we, here, we have the prescribed velocity outside. So we, if we take rho equal to r, we have same numerator and denom denominator. So it moves on the outer boundary. There, we have a fluid velocity, which is not, not 0. And on the interior boundary, if we put rho to 1, the lo logarithm from 1 is 0, we have 0 velocity, which is exactly what we want. Now, we have uh, the Velocity, yes, after <clears throat> substituting all the constants in it, it's um, an, an object. And if I check what kind of object, object this is, I see that it's still a SymPy object. But now if in my workflow I want to get a numeric, numerical object to continue to evaluate it and plot it and compute with it, there's a practical fun uh, function in SymPy called lambdify. Lambdify, where I say which are the variables, and I use the function, then I get a function object. And this, this object here now, I can use it easily and plot it and evaluate it. Since it depends on both variables, I can also fix one variable and plot it only along one edge or anywhere where I want. And that, that's how it looks like if I plot it with matplotlib. So I have the, uh, mo the movement, the motion of the fluid on the outer boundary, and it's not moving on the inner boundary in the new plane. And if I take the solution and I express psi and ether and x and y, the, the expressions which I just showed in the live demo, then I obtain the solution in the original domain and everything is good. Now I, can, I could do post-processing and compute the forces and um, answer the question. However, 100 years ago, Piercy and his colleagues did use another transform. And I will make a comment on that. 
So this can get uh, a bit exotic. There's a different mapping which transforms the eccentric annulus to a rectangle. And the inner boundary gets to be the bottom boundary of the rectangle and the outer boundary gets to be the, <coughs> uh, the inner boundary gets to be the top boundary of the rectangle and the outer boundary of the eccentric annulus gets to be the bottom boundary of the rectangle. On the sides here, there, <coughs> there is periodic boundary conditions. Um, there is all this coding and examples and also a nice figure showing which region gets mapped to where is shown in the proceeding, which is already published on the proceeding uh, webpage. And there is a link to a public GitHub repository where there are notebooks, Jupyter notebooks and Python uh, files with which one can implement all this and see the details. So um, this would be, I, I would have to solve a problem with periodic boundary conditions and movement on the red upper boundary and no movement on the lower one. And this is easy too. It's just a linear solution, linear and in ether. So if ether is equal to uh, beta, yeah, I see a question. I will answer it later. Um, so if one if ether is equal to beta, then the solution is the prescribed solution U, UA, the, the, the motion of the velocity of the armature. And if ether is equal to beta, then I have zero, and that's what is uh, that's what this, uh, the problem says. So here, uh, on the left hand side, I would have the solution in the rectangle, and again expressing. Eth um, Xi and ether and X and Y using the same solution, I solved the original problem. Now, I have two solutions for the same problem. Do they differ? Are they the same? So there's a question to that because we have existence and uniqueness. Because this is not the Navier-Stokes equation with all this um, compressibility and a lot of nonlinear terms. This is the Stokes equation. So we have no uh, non-linear non terms, and here from theorems from Lady Zhenskaya, we have uniqueness. So that means that if I make a conformal map of the eccentric annular domain to any domain that I like, a circle, triangle, anything where I know that I can solve the problem, I solve it and I transform back, I will get the identical solution, even though it may not look identically, and even though I may, it may take some time for me with pen and paper or SumPy to make sure to verify that the solutions are identical. But there exists only one. So in, independently of its appearance, it, all the solutions will be the same. So I can use trans conformal mappings to any domain, any geometry that suits me best, if I find it, of course. So after having solved um, for the fluid velocity, I can do post-processing um, here on the left-hand side along the larger gap. I compared the two symbolic solutions in blue and orange, and they coincide perfectly. And I compared it with the computational fluid solution comp computed with ANSYS CFX in green. And we see that's practically the same. There's only a small deviation at the boundary, but this deviation is a problem, is an error of the 3D uh, finite volumes method because I would have to had to make a mesh uh, very, very, very fine that would have taken too much time. So in this case, this, the symbolic analytical approach is more exact. And on the right hand side, I see the, um, the flow force that acts upon the surface of the armature for different relative eccentricities. So for 10% here, 80% there. And we see that the more eccentricity I have, more force I have. This means that the force that acts upon the inner, surf the inner circle or the armature in this case is influenced by eccentricity. And with the help of SumPy, 
we could answer that question in our company. So uh, to conclude, uh, nowadays still analytical formula are used in fluid power engineering and analytical solutions in simple domains are known. There are, are a lot of textbooks on that. And with the help of SymPy and conformal mappings, also difficult domains can be transformed into the simple domains where we can solve, the solu uh, solve for the solution. And SymPy helps us with the separation of real and imaginary parts makes analytical simplification, visualizes the formula one, one works with. There's also a, a very practical sum function uh, in SymPy with which I can implement easily Fourier, Fourier series when solving in the problem with non-homogeneous right part in a rectangle. And finally, when the symbolic computation computational part is done, one can easily numerify the final solution with LambdaFi. <clears throat> so further references. Um, this work is published already on the conference page, Conformer Mappings with SymPy. There are all the details. And in that paper, there is a link to a GitHub, to a public GitHub repository, where there are notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, and Python files with which one can um, reproduce what I just did and play, uh, experiment with them or use them. Further details also uh, on Taylor expansions in similar contexts can be found here in a note on leakage jet forces, application in the modeling of digital twins of hydraulic valves in the International Journal of Fluid Power. And concerning the uniqueness that it doesn't matter where I solve my problem, I always will get the same problem. There is uh, the mathematical theory of viscous incompressible flow from Olga Ledizhenskaya. So um, I thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Um, so we're, oh, I think we lost you for a second. Um, OK, you seem to be back. Excellent. Well, again, thank you for the talk. Uh, and you did great for keeping the time. So that's, again, fantastic. We're going to take a few questions that we have uh, now in the Q&A. Uh, if people have them, please keep uh, sending them in. So um, let's see, we're first going to show this one uh, from Tetsuo. Uh, so can SymPy solve the problem by discretization methods, such as a finite value method and uh, and finite element methods? Uh, well, but uh, the, the thing is, of, of course, you can, if you use, the thing is, if you use, uh, those are numerical methods. So if you are doing a numerical problem, you have to think if it's worthwhile using symbolical tools, but of course, so if you are doing numerics, you can also use NumPy. However, there is an intersection of both worlds because, for example, for the finite element method, you have to you have your shape functions, you have to integrate your shape functions, and part of that can be done symbolically. And there's also a package that does that. It's called SimpleFem or Simple Finite Elements, and that package uses SymPy. OK, uh, thanks. I'm going to mark that as answered. And then um, I, I had one as well. Uh, let me share this on stage. So um, so are there areas in your work that you found that you've kind of needed to help SymPy along with? Or have you been finding that it's been really robust in all the cases that you've tried so far? <laughs> OK, no, no uh, I, there, there's still work to be done with SymPy. For example, the second transformation I, uh, my colleague and me had to help uh, manually to separate real and real and imaginary parts uh, of this arc tangle and tangents and so on. The first transformation was simple for SymPy to separate. In the second, we had to uh, open the, some books and help a bit. Sure. Um, although 
I'm just asking out of total curiosity here. Did you find that that process, like obviously you had to do the the intellectual work of like finding some ways to help it along, but was the actual kind of uh, process of of coding in additional um, methods for it, or or, or uh, ways to kind of help it along, was that pretty straightforward? No, the the rest was uh, straight straightforward actually. Awesome. And with the help of Simpy, since in the Jupyter, I remember back the, I don't know when this Jupyter notebook exactly started, but I remember that in 2012, I, I uh, tried something with Simpy and the, the, the answer was not nice at all in the terminal, like the analytical part without LaTeX rendering, it was, difficult, it was difficult and not so attractive compared to Maple, for example. But, but now with the Jupyter notebook and the nice LaTeX rendering of the formulas, it's, it's much more comfortable. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really been beautiful and amazing to see how all these tools have been able to leverage things like Jupyter. So, um, okay, and then so I don't see any other questions, uh, but uh, if you have time afterward, it would be great if you could also uh, you if you could link in the Slack as well uh, to your slides yes. uh, and your GitHub repository. I think that'd be great. Um, Perfect. Okay. So again, thanks for keeping to time, and I think that's all. So uh, let's go ahead and thank our speaker for an excellent, excellent yes. talk. Thank you for the moderation, and thank you for the questions. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll now turn this over to. Uh,